Yeah, bingo, we're back. This is Think Tech Tech Talks. I'm Jay Fidel. We're talking about Aloha Safe Alert. This is very important. So make notes, um, and maybe that we'll have a final exam at the end, you know, in a short answer, multiple choice. Um, I'm only kidding. Uh, here on Think Tech Talks. And we have uh, Linnell Marble. She's the executive director of what, Aloha Safe, is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay. Executive and we, director of the Hawaii Executive Collaborative. Executive Collaborative, that's yes. great. And it's great to have multiple organizations involved in an effort like this. Um, and Michael Kamita, uh, tech lead okay, of Aloha Safe Alert. Okay, I guess the next question is, of course, welcome to the show, both of you. Thank you for coming down. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is, uh, what is Aloha Safe Alert? Tell the people. Well, I'll start it off and then hand it over to Michael. Um, Aloha Safe Alert is the Hawaii official State of Hawaii Exposure Notification Act. And uh, it was created through a public-private partnership with the Department of Health, Hawaii Executive Collaborative, um, and AIO Digital, and a number of community partners who have come on board to adopt it. Um, and what the app does um, in short, and I know we'll get into a lot of detail uh, in this ha next half hour, but in short, what it does is it helps to provide exposure notifications uh, to people who may have been in contact with someone else within six feet over 15 minutes um, to COVID-19, and that allows them to get into quarantine hopefully sooner um, so that they can protect their family and their community. Wow. So from the, a functional point of view, an individual who has downloaded this app on my, on my phone, uh, any kind of phone, any kind of smartphone, uh, so I, uh, it's running, okay? It's running. What happens when it runs and I've been exposed too, too long, I guess, or for a period that's of some concern, what happens? Yeah, so, so I, I can take this one. So um, your phone is going to be exchanging random, basically, codes with other devices using Bluetooth low energy. And these codes are random, as I said, and they change pretty frequently. So they're essentially anonymized or they're not going to be associated back with you. And so as you go about your day, your phone is going to be exchanging these, these random numbers with all of the other devices that it meets. So then later on, um, if you unfortunately test positive for COVID-19, the Department of Health is going to uh, send you a text message that will allow you to, to share your diagnosis status with, with the app. And basically what that means is you would be taking all of those codes that you broadcasted out while you were infectious and sharing them with the Department of Health and the Association of Public Health Labs. And so essentially there's this database of all of those positive codes, all of those codes that were broadcasted out that, that someone who later tested positive was sharing. And again, those are all random and constantly changing, so they're not linked back to any individual. So for all of the people that were nearby you or, or were you know, in close proximity to you, they're gonna, their app is going to check against that list of positive codes. And they're gonna say, oh, I saw these positive codes for, you know, and if it's at least 15 minutes and you were within sort of six feet of, of proximity, then it's gonna give you a notification that says, hey, you know, not so many words, but hey, you know, you probably you should go get a test. You may have been exposed to COVID-19. Um, and it's going to give you links to the Department of Health resources to go get tested and, you know, the other steps that you should should take. Okay. And so it's going to it's going to give me that notification immediately. I mean, after 15 minutes. Well, it's going to give you the notification after the person reports themselves positive, right? So the hope is that if the person knows that they're positive, then they're not going to be, you know, going out and associating with people. And so, you know, this is that over the last 14 days, you know, because that's when the infectiousness window is, you know, you may have been in contact with someone that went on to test positive for COVID-19. And you're only going to get that notification if you're, you know, threshold of exposure met those those criteria. Certain number of minutes, and I suppose distance too. Yeah, the Bluetooth so, will read the distance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Bluetooth doesn't it doesn't technically read the distance. It's technically reading the signal strength, 
but they've done a lot of studies to basically approximate distance based on signal strength. And the good thing about that is that if there are barriers in place, say you're only two feet apart, but there's a wall in place, because that wall is in place, the signal strength is going to make it look like it's much farther than two feet. So that's how, you know, they're sort of accounting or there's some allowance for, you know, having walls or boundaries in, in place. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's consistent with a, an accurate look at it. If there's a wall, you can't breathe through a wall, most walls. Yeah, you hope, but you know, there are still, you know, air vents and things like that where we've seen, you know, infections cross over, but yeah, we do hope uh, that it's limited. If I'm, if I just got, um, you know, a report from my doctor or whatever, that I have, that I am infected and I'm carrying the virus. And I get this, um, I get this text message, you say, yeah. what is it? The text message comes and says, Jay, you, you, you have been, you've tested positive. It, it, it uh, would you like to include this on your copy of Aloha, Aloha Safe, right? It, and then it, you say yes, right? It, it doesn't quite say that because um, it would be a HIPAA violation to disclose the, the, the person's actual status. So, so the text message, I believe, just says anonymously share your test result with COVID, um, with Aloha Safe Alert to, to help your community. And then it and, provides and you, you have a, to opt a link. In. You yeah, and then in. you have to opt in. And then there's like two more layers of consent that you have to go through. And this is part of the um, Apple and Google system, which is really focused on both, both privacy and, and consent. Um, you know, in a perfect world, you wouldn't be concerned about all this privacy and consent business. You know, if we're talking about saving lives here, and that's, I think that's one of the issues that has been raised by COVID. You know, we're talking about saving lives. As for example, you know, this whole thing about vaccine, I prefer not to take the vaccine. What? You know, it's not for you we're giving you the vaccine, it's we're giving you the vaccine for the community. It's like, you know, the like 30% of the military, they don't want it. What? You know, what about the rest of the guys in the military? What about having a fighting force that's not sick? How about that? And, and I really find, um, you know, that we, that we have concepts about HIPAA and privacy and consent that may be a little outmoded. We're lucky this time, but in a, in a more difficult time, we would have to look at the issue of whether we really need to be so careful about privacy and consent, especially when it affects other people. Right. What? Oh, ahead, I would Michael. say that the different countries have taken different approaches to it. And, and America is, you know, we have a constitution and where we tend to be on the, the privacy focused side. And, and yeah, there are limitations because, you know, anonymity and privacy are so preserved in this system. It is sort of limiting. You can't track who's doing it. People aren't forced to opt in. But in some ways, you know, that's a good thing that, you know, we're not going full big brother in result are uh, in response to the, the pandemic. Yeah, we'll see next time yeah. whether it's different. <laughs> well, now you were going to say something on this? No, I was going to say, um, I, I totally understand what you're saying, but what this does is I, I think it can assure the community because a lot of what we're hearing is that concern. Well, are they going to know exactly where I was? Businesses are concerned. Are they going to identify my restaurant or my place of business of where this happened and because of the privacy measures it does not do that it doesn't identify the location but what instead it does is just tells you here's you know you need to go ahead and get into quarantine you could be on the bus and you don't know um, who you were next to so if you get infected you can't say I was in the bus next to a, a certain person, but what this does is it gives you an alert that you were exposed and you should get into quarantine. And hopefully that gives, you know, stops that interaction and stops the, the spreading further of the disease. Yeah, yeah. so uh, what is, how does this product, this, this uh, app, uh, how is it different from the one organized by Apple and Google? So this is um, organized by, by Apple and Google. So this is using the Google Apple Exposure Notifications API. And it's on the same system as you know every other uh, state that, that is using the Exposure Notification system. So this system we're talking about is the system for the United States anyway. I mean, you have different uh, implementations in different states, but the system itself, the technology is national. Am I right? Yeah, um, I mean, basically, in response to the pandemic, Google and Apple came together and 
um, it, it was really them that needed to come together because they control all of the smartphones, right? You can't really do anything on a smartphone without ideally both of them cooperating. And, and the phones really aren't or weren't designed for this purpose. And so they had to make changes to the operating system in order to, to enable this functionality. Let me just think loosely with you here. Suppose we didn't rely on either Apple or Google. Suppose we created this national database from information in the cell carriers. And the cell carriers collaborated in having a national database based on information transmitted by the by the phones through the cell carriers. Wouldn't that also work? It would do a different thing. So the, the Google and Apple system um, does not collect location data. It's actually prohibited from accessing a lot of those sensors. And so it's um, so the Google and Apple system is checking device to device contacts, whereas um, a location based system, you know, would be location based. It would help you track where people went. The, the problem with that is that GPS has limited accuracy. Um, and that in a lot of cases, the GPS data isn't really useful. For example, in like a hotel, you could have someone test positive on the first floor, but the people on the 15th floor, you know, don't need to quarantine. And so a pure location based GPS based system, you know, wouldn't really be able to distinguish those those instances. Uh, so this is better. The Bluetooth is better. It's it's better in some ways and and worse in when in, in others. You know I, this is, system is designed to be complementary to traditional contact tracing. So it's not replacing the the actual contact tracer's job. It's it's helping them notify people faster and it's helping them identify people that like a contact tracing interview isn't going to to help. Um, but it doesn't you know replace trying to go back words and try to figure out where people got it and, and find identify hotspots uh, like that. But on the plus side, you know, there's uh, privacy preservations here. I mean, it depends on how, how you look at that. Um, but, you know, I think especially in, in here, you know, those privacy protections are really important for getting adoption. And so that's that's part of the uh, part of the reason for the emphasis on privacy and anonymity is that a lot of people that, that would be hesitant to join in otherwise, you know, are, are going to be willing to because of, of those protections. And so this system is sort of like a happy medium between, you know, going full big, you know, if we had a full big brother surveillance state, then the contact tracers could very easily say, you know, every person that you were in contact with over the last 14 days, and they would have a database of that, that information. Um, and like, yes, that would help the contact tracers that would be in the interests of public health, but it's, it's hard to imagine that that system wouldn't be abused for, for other reasons. Um, what about this? What about this moment when I get um, a message from my phone and it says my a text message, you know, you, you should go, you should go get tested. You, you may have been exposed. I mean, it doesn't have to be hard. Yeah, hard, hard requirements. You may have been exposed. Does anybody else get that message? Does the state have that information? No, Do they say, Jay, you should really go down. You know, you got this message. It's no. up to me. It's completely up to me. Correct. Yeah. So the, with the way that the system works is that that comparison. So, so as I said earlier, there's like a basically a database of all those random positive codes. It's, it's your individual device that downloads that positive codes list and makes that check. So that check to see whether or not I've met the threshold for notification, that's happening on my device and only on my device, you know, and, and no one else is notified unless I decide to, you know, which I should, you know, call my healthcare provider and reach out and something like that. But you but may this, not. Yeah. Well, you know, which is, you know, you're right to do so, I imagine. Well, the um, other thing is out of, out of uh, there's 1.4 million people in the state. Um, and I don't know how many of those are adult, you know, who walk around with smartphones, but you have something close to 400,000 installs here. Am I right? How, yeah, many, so how many people, how many people are, are capable of having it installed, but haven't? So when we got data from DBED and Michael, you can help correct me here, but we, we looked at, tried to look at cell phone users, smart cell phone users, and it's about a million people. Um, in the state who are smartphone users. So um, 
that's the amount that hopefully so you, you have we'll six hundred thousand to go. Yes. And it would be, it would be <laughs> I think Michael and I are gonna say the same thing, but he'll probably say it better than me. So you go ahead. <laughs> well yeah, well so so first off, most estimates say that it's around eighty percent of the population has a, a smartphone. Okay. Um, and studies have shown that this technology is effective even at low levels of adoption. So even at about you know 12, 15 percent, there's you know a noticeable reduction in uh, cases. And you know in in England it was about 30 percent, and they you know have had a significant reduction in in cases. For example, in in England, counties that had higher adoption than their neighbors by 1%, 1 1% more adoption led to a 2.3% reduction in cases. So, you know, in comparing the neighboring counties, higher adoption led to, you know, less cases by, you know, 2.3% for every 1% increase in, in adoption. And so the studies are saying, you know, this isn't going to be a perfect cure. Like, yes, I think, uh, so if 80% of the population is using the app, models do predict that this would be enough to, to quell the pandemic on its own, but that's really not what we're asking. You know, this is a, a, another tool in the Department of Health's arsenal, along with manual contact tracing, along with testing, along with the vaccine, you know, and so we don't need, you know, it would be nice to have that level of adoption and the more people are using it, the more effective it will be. But, you know, the studies and, and our, you know, uh, recent results have, have shown that it's, it's still effective even at lower levels of adoption. Sure, but I'll tell you that, you know, you, you have these days you have phones which have security uh, security capability um, where you can look at the phone and it opens. Right? The phone opens when you look at it because it recognizes your face. Okay, while it's recognizing your face, it could recognize whether you're wearing a mask on your face. Right? And it could say to you, Fidel, what's wrong with you, Fidel? Why don't you wear a mask today? Um, uh, would, would that be a violation of somebody's rights? Tell me true now. I don't think that that would be a violation of somebody's rights, but I think if Apple made it so that when you tried to use Face ID, it reprimanded you, um, I think that a lot of people would cancel them or would be less <laughs> less inclined yeah. to, to buy apple products if it if they were you know more overtly preaching like that I well apple say. is very concerned about privacy i don't know if you remember there was a terrorist on the west coast and um the fbi got the guy's phone and asked apple to crack the phone so they could see if he was talking I, with I, other I, remember that I, case i i know and a apple lot about refused to do it <laughs> Well, Apple Apple didn't just refuse to do it. Apple was unable to do it. And not only that, like I, I know of the I, I work in the computer forensics industry, so I know a lot about about Then you know who, who cracked the phone. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I was surprised the Israelis. They, the Israelis I'm surprised that they the did not talk to Celebrite immediately. <laughs> I, I work with Celebrite in my day job quite frequently. And then yeah, that's I'm that should have been their first option. I'm I, that was a that was a ploy by the FBI director to get rid of civil liberties. That wasn't uh, an actual need for, for that. Um, well, Linnell, I want to know how this all came together, okay? You saw it come together. You saw it come together through the, I guess, the spring, summer, and fall. <clears throat> and then you, yeah. you, know, you guys, you know, you, you did the institutional steps necessary to make it happen. Can you tell our uh, viewing audience exactly how that worked? Where did it start? How did it evolve? And, you know, the run up to, as you guys told me, which I think is so cute, uh, the run up to the rollout day, which happened to be January 6th, 2021. Can you talk about that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, this, this app was really developed through a community effort. I mean, Michael is one of the key people, is a part of it. And it started last summer, um, if not a little earlier, where it was, what can we do to pull together to try and help to control the spread? of this disease. And so we got a lot of smart community minded uh, people together, again, Michael being one of them, um, Brandon, Robert Carisi being other, uh, a few others. And they started developing this technology and talking with the Department of Health and talking about the, the impact that it could have. 
um, the Department of Health came on board um, and said, yes, this was another layer of safety that, that could be developed or that could help to mitigate the spread. And so in November, um, we decided to pilot uh, this app on the Nutty. So it got piloted there, um, got rolled out to all of Maui County in December. Hawaii Island, right before the end of the year, then rolled it out to their island, and then we went statewide on January 6th. Um, our goal, our initial goal, based on some of the studies that Michael shared, um, one out of Oxford said that if we get 15% of the community to download the app, then uh, it'll decrease infections by 8% and deaths by 6%. So our goal was about 150,000 downloads. Um, it was being effective, but of course, if you get to that, it'll it'll become even more effective for the community. And now we're, you know, at over three hundred thousand. How, so, how does it integrate with contract? Uh, excuse me, contact tracing. <clears throat> where where does that enter into the, um, you know, the the analysis? Yeah. So this system sort of runs in in parallel. Um, mm -hmm. One of the one of the concerns that the Department of Health had was that they didn't want to add to to the work that they were already doing. So, um, you know, it it basically just relies on the Department of Health as the verifiers of who tests positive and and what their infectiousness window is, and um, that's about it. It's um, just what, what about the? <clears throat> and the reason I'm asking the question is that in the middle of in that period that Linnell's talking about, uh, we had. Uh, some problems about contact tracing and the Department of Health wasn't really doing contract tracing. I'm not sure what it's doing these what? days. But the question is, is that part of the formula, the algorithm um, by which this system works? Or is it is it just it's just, you know, demonstrated cases of infection? I think what was key and Michael, you can jump into I think what was key was what we did um, was incorporate an automatic notification system so that it wasn't dependent on a contact tracer having to call a person to say, hey, um, here's the code, put it into the app so that you can um, anonymously share your results. So now what Department of Health does is when they get their daily case um, information, it that's where the text message automatic notification comes in. So it becomes more efficient. Um, and as Michael said, it runs parallel to the contact traces. They're doing what they're doing, continuing to do so. Yeah. But now people can get um, that automatic notification a lot faster. Yeah, I mean, I would add my reaction is that contact tracing, however well you do it, uh, you know, whether you do it really well or maybe not so well, it doesn't, it's, there's a certain, I'm gonna call it, uh, there's a certain subjective quality to it. Well, uh, and people, and you, and you, this, is, this is scientific, yeah. what you're doing now. This is electronic, rational science and, and a specific electronic algorithm working. Contact tracing, that's not quite like that. So it wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily be helpful. You know, we should, we should go through your, your uh, drawings, your, your graphics. Uh, can we do that? Let's show some and you guys can explain um, th these are for the public to understand how this, this system works, and I think that'd be very valuable in this discussion. Okay. Let's show let's show the pictures and see. Okay, oh, so that's just uh, what is what is that? What that, is that? Um, that is a community uh, a flyer that was developed. Um, people can go to alohasafealert.org. There's a toolkit. So any businesses, individuals, if you want more information, sort of a quick overview. You can go on to the website, download the toolkit, share it, um, and it gives a, a quick overview of, of how the app works and how you can download it. Okay, so I can go on my phone right now this minute and I can look for Aloha Safe uh, and I can download it right now. It takes a minute and now, I, now I'm in the system. Is that simple? Correct. Yeah. Okay, oh, terrific. Okay, what more pictures? We got more pictures? Okay, what, what's this one? Yeah, so this is, is, as I was saying, you're only going to get that alert if, if you meet that minimum exposure threshold. And then I sort of explained how distance and signal strength works. And then the, the duration is 15 minutes and the time is, you know, within the last 14 days while you were infectious. And those variables are determined differently by, by each state. And so, you know, basically following CDC guidance for six feet, 15 minutes. Um, 
And so here's sort of an example of, of how Aloha Safe works. You know, the people are all hanging out, they're exchanging those random IDs. And then if the person tests positive, then people um, who were nearby are going to get that notification. And the friend that didn't have the app, you know, isn't going to be able to get the notification that he may have been exposed in the past 14 days to, to someone that had COVID-19. Okay. Is that it? All right. Oh, here's um, more. Yeah. So, so this is using that Google Apple exposure notification system and all of the different states that are on the system. And I think this is out of date. I think they're up to like 24, 25 now. Um, but basically half of the different states are using the this system currently. And any other state that is coming on is also going to be part of this uh, Association of Public Health Labs partnership. And so that's a, actually a partnership between Google, Microsoft, and the Association of Public Health Labs. And what that, that means, I think the real value there is, say someone from New York comes and hangs out in Hawaii and ends up getting sick um, when they return, they then share that positive result. And because it's interoperable through all the different apps and through those different states, People in Hawaii who have made been in contact will get that alert. That's no, that's really good. That there's an interoperability aspect mm -hmm. to it. Um, let, let me let me ask you one question that I think is 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 clear. We have we have vaccines now, and you know with vaccines come complacency. And with this um, order of the CDC yesterday today about how it's okay now, you know, you can go outside, you can talk to people just like you were before. I'm, I'm troubled by that, if you want to know my personal reaction to that. Um, that two, two, two people are, have vaccinated, then it's okay that they you know, operate the pre-COVID. Um, but how does that affect your app? Um, how does that affect the usefulness and the acceptance of your app to, to, to A, to have, to have the vaccine in general, uh, of course, with all the variants that are so threatening, and B, to have the CDC and I guess the State Department of Health also saying, you know, you can go back to pre-COVID conduct if, if you have, you know, two people who've been inoculated. How does that affect your app? I mean, it, it hopefully it reduces the necessity of it, you know, and, and that's sort of what we want, right? We want anything that makes any COVID prevention things unnecessary. And, um, you know, but, but it, it's sort of a, a Swiss cheese defense, I think, is, is the metaphor where, you know, lots of different layers of defense. And so even if there are some holes that something might get through, that there's, you know, another layer behind it that has holes in different places or something like that to, to catch things. And, and you know, um, th there might be lots of people that, you know, aren't going to take it, the, the vaccine, and, and, you know, we don't know how it affects long term or, or stuff like that. Um, you know, and, and we're hoping to to take some of the stuff that we're learning and work that into the app, you know, so you'll get a different notification, maybe in different like quarantine suggestions, if you have been vaccinated or not, you know, take that vaccine status into account in the reporting and the notifying and stuff like that. Um, you know, so we just have a platform where we can expand it as, as the, you know, the needs and those thresholds change. Boy, this is that. pretty exciting. Yes, Lynn, yeah, sorry. No, I was going to say, I also think that, you know, we're not in the clear yet, you know, and we're in tier three. Um, so things are opening up, but this is now when we can really see the efficacy of the app. Um, the fact that we have almost 400,000 downloads, the fact that um, people are going out more and there's, you know, the, the limits are expanding a bit more. Now is when people should really start using that mm -hmm. app to help uh, get people notified quicker. So what's the future of this, this whole program here? I mean, there, there's a lot of people around, including in Washington, that say, we're gonna lick this whole thing. We're gonna all finish with it by what, the summer or the fall, and you won't see, you won't see uh, you know, coronavirus anymore. Uh, what's the future of this program, given that possibility? Um, then the program would, would mostly go, go away. Um, so the, the Google Apple Exposure Notifications API, the, the underlying system that we're using, it is in the fine print from Google and Apple that in the event that this pandemic ceases, they are going to shut that functionality off. Um, so, you know, that, that is, you know, knock on wood, something that happens. Um, 
but you know, I'm not counting on it in the, the short term or at least in the, the immediate future. No, I wouldn't count on it either. Um, certainly, and, and this is something I, I wanted to cover with you guys before we ran out of time. And, and that is this, uh, it seems to me that this is groundbreaking, you know, on a number of, a number of reasons. I mean, one is it's an example of the community coming together with all the privacy considerations and all that, coming together and doing something in a community collaborative uh, where you can actually have some benefit with, with the electronics, which are, of course, you know, there's, they're everywhere. Um, but, you know, we're not finished with, with viruses. If, if we learn one thing in the past year, if we became all of us you know, completely aware. Um, we learned we learned that viruses are everywhere. They're ubiquitous, and they mutate. <clears throat> and uh, a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a pandemic turns into a, a rolling pandemic. And so, and so, I think we're we're <clears throat> we're going to be in a virus world for the rest of our lives. And and the question is how well we manage that. And as you said, Michael, I mean, it's a matter of um, a, a portfolio, a, a, a ditty bag of all kinds of things, inventory by which we can deal with with the you know the pandemic or, or the viruses going forward. There will be more coronaviruses in the future, maybe not the same, but nevertheless as threatening potentially. So this kind of technology, it seems to me, um, is going to be with us too. It is one of those things in the ditty bag. Um, do you agree? And how would you change it? How would you envision that, modify it, make it more robust in the future? This technology and, and the lessons we, we've learned, I think, are, are mostly going to be in sort of pandemic response and in how to, to use the, the technology at our disposal. Um, a lot of what this is is really bound by the limitations of the smartphone hardware and the amount of people that have smartphones and, and what the smartphones you know can do without having no battery life or, or whatever. And so there's a lot of, of ways that, that those that were limited. I think what, what long term, I think Google and Apple are transitioning to being medical device companies. And I think we're going to see a lot more of, of that. Um, you know, in recognizing that, you know, in the way that Apple has with the iWatch and stuff like that, that, you know, there's an opportunity for more healthcare sort of uses based on, you know, these little computers that we're carrying around in our pocket. Does it trouble you that Apple and Google, private companies operated by their management and stockholders, uh, have control of this? They have control of the development of these devices? And this G A E N, what is it? Uh, yeah, Google Apple Exposure Notification. They, they um, have control of that. Does it bother you that they wanted to turn it off? They can do that without any approval by anybody, or turn it on. The same thing. Th this system, not so much. Um, this system is really designed to be as private and privacy preserving as possible. And so Google and Apple and even the Department of Health don't have a lot of insight into into things. And so this system is pretty safe. It is, you know, dedicated only to the pandemic. And it and it also in the fine print is that it can't be commercialized and, and things like that. So so we know that, that this is safe. Um, but but Google and Apple, they've got a lot of better ways to, to learn stuff about you. And they don't need this in order to to know all of those those things. I mean, I mean so like, how come yes, I was it, not how come I was not advised of this earlier? <laughs> Only joke, joke. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think what, what was really good about this was that it showed that, that Google and Apple could come together along with, you know, Microsoft and, and other, you know, very large companies and, and they would be able to put in uh, you know, just nonprofit hours to assist Department of Health, you know, worldwide in, in developing a, a response. And it really, it really had to be Google and Apple because, you know, they control the hardware and yeah. the soft, you know, and so without their partnership, you know, there, this couldn't have been done. Yeah, true, true fact. Yeah. Okay, also, we're out of time, yeah. Linnell, and I want to give you uh, the last word here. <laughs> so say what you wanted and then tell us what you want to leave, the message you want to leave with the public. Well, I think it's one in the same. Um, my last words and the message I want to leave to the public is that this technology um, 
is like you said, it's very key, it's groundbreaking, I think it makes us smarter, God forbid, any other pandemic or any other um, disease like this happens again, hopefully we can get control of it faster with the help of technology like this. But in the end, it's really about the user opting in. Um, when you get that text message saying to share anonymously, share your result, share that so that you can help protect your community. So the fact that everyone stepped up to download it, I hope they also take that next step to, to, to use it um, should they get any kind of notification. And it wouldn't have been possible without everyone who's doing it. So let's just continue to move ahead and, and continue to utilize this technology. Yeah, just as uh, the, the situation, the pandemic has forced us to develop vaccines in a, in a rapid speed that we never saw before, has also forced us to do this electronic development as well. And it's interesting that the, the start and finish of the development efforts in both cases um, took about the same amount of time. <laughs> both came out within a few weeks of each other. Uh, Michael, I feel bad that I haven't given you the opportunity to give a last word. You want to give a last word too? Um, you know, just that, that this is, is safe and this is privacy preserving and that, you know, if we don't use this system, you know, we might have to go full Big Brother. And so, you know, we hope people that will will use this system so that, you know, we aren't tempted to or don't don't need to go full Big Brother to combat this pandemic. Yeah, it's all about voluntary collaboration and caring for your neighbor. Thank you so much, Linnell. Linnell Marble and Michael Kamita, really appreciate your time. Aloha. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you. Aloha.